Hi everybody, my name is Mehreen and I'm coordinating this webinar on safe water sanitation and health for all during and post COVID-19. This international webinar is hosted by CSC in partner with Water Aid South Asia, Emory University and World Health Organization. Thank you all for logging in from different time zones. We have received an overwhelming response for this webinar. More than 1400 uh, registrations have been received from 65 different countries, majorly from South Asia, United States of America, UK, Africa. And we have a mix of um, uh, registrations from different organizations, academia, NGOs, private organizations, and even government. I also take this opportunity to introduce the uh, senior director and academic director of School of Water and Waste, CSC, who is the main person behind the conceptualization of this webinar, Dr. Suresh Kumar Rohela. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Maureen, for the brief introduction. And I'm really happy uh, to see the response which we have got. I welcome all the participants as well as the speakers who have agreed to be here. Uh, just to tell you in two minutes that uh, this webinar is part of the series of webinars with School of Water and Waste, which is a capacity building initiative of Center for Science and Environment New Delhi organizes. Uh, and we this is the ninth in series, the webinar. And uh, increasingly that in spite of that, we live, live in a weird and difficult time with COVID, uh, you know, but we have seen that increasing interest in the primary needs, water and sanitation, because we work in the water space and we feel that uh, it is equally important that we keep discussing these primary needs, which uh, we need to have safe access to water and sustainable sanitation. So uh, one thing is sure that COVID has reinstated the need for global action and uh, the need to ensure uh, access to clean water and sanitation as a human right and as a critical element to protect human health. Uh, key global sector players uh, have played an important role over a period of time. Uh, they have developed you know, guidelines, uh, approaches like guideline on sanitation and health by WHO uh, that summarizes the evidence of effectiveness of a you know, range of sanitation interventions that can provide a comprehensive framework for health protecting sanitation. And there are several tools which have been developed. For example, Sanipath developed by Emory University to assess the public health risks from unsafe fecal sludge management in poor urban neighborhoods. And then there is a shit flow diagram which Center for Science and Environment has been working with global sector players. And we have tested these tools in global south across the world. And uh, we have, uh, this represents the population at risk due to unsafe disposal of uh, fecal sludge. So, you know, this today, the webinar is part of, you know, a global, uh, from local to global, both, and connecting also the national, uh, uh, you know, institutionalization of certain uh, policies, approaches, and tools. And we have a very interesting panel, which we have today, WHO, Kate has agreed to be with us, uh, who would be our first speaker. Then I have uh, my colleague Ritush and Abdul Murid from Watrait who would be talking about the SFD work. And then we have uh, in the sequence, uh, Christine, Professor Christine from Emory, who has agreed to speak about the learnings from the ground. And then we will also have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Carol Islam, director, uh, regional director from South Asia, who is here with us, who would share the learnings from the ground and tell us that what are the risks and challenges. And we are very happy to welcome Vijay Chaurasyaji, who is the advisor of the Central Public uh, Health Environmental Engineering Organization, Government of India, which is the standard setting technical body of, uh, you know, sanitation and water sector. So welcome Vijay Chaurasyaji and welcome all the speakers. So I've covered all. So uh, thank you very much, all the participants. Now we'll start formally our webinar. And uh, Mehreen, if you can take on from here. Yeah, thank you, sir. Before we start the webinar, some housekeeping rules. Just a sec. Um, allocated time for the presentation is 20 minutes each. Attendees should mute the microphone 
when the webinar is going on. Attendees are requested to use the question and answer tab to type in questions while the presentation is ongoing with their name, city, and to whom the question is to, ad to be addressed. So uh, starting, uh, just giving you a, a, yeah, one more important thing that uh, we, will, we are going live. There is live streaming through YouTube, through CSE Facebook page and CSE LinkedIn. The agenda for the webinar is that, we'll, as Dr. Rohila mentioned, that we'll start with the WHO presentation, which will be given by Kate Metlicott. So um, I let will. Me, let me take this opportunity to introduce Kate uh, as a moderator of the session. Kate is the sanitation and wastewater team leader within the WASH team of the World Health Organization based out of Geneva. Uh, within this role, Kate is responsible for WHO's normative work translating evidence to policy and practice through WHO guidelines and health sector collaborations where sanitation is a critical component of disease control. So Kate, uh, uh, you can take 20 minutes and share with us uh, the uh, approach of an evidence uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suresh, and um, welcome everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you today to try to, um, I want to kind of give you a broad view of what WHO is doing on WASH and COVID and uh, dig in a little bit to the sanitation aspects before passing over to some more specific pieces of work around sanitation and health. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. Okay, so firstly, just to kind of start with the, the uh, pandemic, I think we're all becoming armchair epidemiologists and watching these numbers every day. So we've, we've just gone over 11 million cases and, um, and half a million deaths. So we're really just at the beginning of this pandemic and you can see the places where that are suffering the most here in dark blue. Um, so as you know, it's, it's been six months now since WHO started responding to the COVID pandemic. And we have three main documents that guide the response. So there's the overall UN humanitarian plan, the COVID strategy and the operational guidelines. I think for all of us who work in water and sanitation, it's extremely obvious that wash and hand washing is a really critical part of disease control. Um, unfortunately, sometimes for our health sector colleagues, that's not so obvious. They're really thinking about the, the testing, the diagnostics, uh, the treatment methods. So we've really um, worked to make sure that WASH is part of the operational response and you will see it here within five key recommendations. So I think that's really the message to all of you as well and whichever capacity you're in is making sure that water and sanitation is really part of the national response to COVID. Okay, so one of the things that we've just launched just two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, is the Hand Hygiene for All initiative. And the reason for this is twofold. One, because um, it is really one of the most important things we can be doing uh, to prevent transmission of COVID. But also I think for many of us who, who talk about working on WASH, the hygiene part of that has been a little neglected for many years. So hand hygiene, critical for COVID, but actually something we need to be doing more of regardless and really making sure that people in, you know, in every aspect of life, whether that's in uh, healthcare facilities, schools, workplaces, public places can, can practice hand hygiene. So you'll be hearing more about this in the, in the weeks and months to come as we try and mobilize support around you know, this, this learning and exchange of evidence, supporting implementation, trying to mobilize the financing and making sure there's kind of regular reporting on that, of course, to SDG 6.2, but um, also the monitoring of, of inputs, uh, financing, and what, what a good programmatic approach is. Okay, so um, in terms of the technical advice, which I'm going to get into a bit more now, 
Um, on our website, you will find this document that is the, the technical advice on wash and waste and COVID. There's an update coming very soon. I think in the next few days, there'll be an update to, uh, to the current one that's there with some small additions. But I'm going to try to you know, give you the key takeaways now. So of course, as I've said, you know, hand hygiene is, is um, the number one thing we should be doing from a wash perspective, enabling that hand hygiene making sure that we have good environmental hygiene, so um, regular cleaning and uh, disinfection, especially in health facilities, and, and disinfectants are very effective against uh, the, the COVID virus. Um, on water and sanitation, we, you know, I think it, there's been lots of questions, oh, do we need to do something different for, for COVID? Um, no, but we need to do what we know we need to do. All of the existing guidance around safe management of water supply and sanitation is still relevant. It's just uh, another reason why we need to, to really um, make sure that that's happening for everyone in all places. We need to make sure that WASH investments are absolutely fundamental to the response. So as I said before, making sure that that WASH is not left out of, of the picture when it comes to developing national response plans for, for COVID. And also making sure that we're making these co-benefits arguments. So these are not just investments for COVID, they're investments for health um, and for, for many kinds of infectious diseases. Okay, I just want to tell you a little bit about the, the virus. And I know we have very eminent Christine Mo here, who I'm sure will, will, will correct me if I get any of this wrong. But um, just firstly to understand that COVID is a, the SARS CoV 2 virus, I should say, is an envelope virus, which you would think when you hear that, that it's quite tough, and that it um, might be difficult to kill. In fact, that's that's not the case. Uh, envelope viruses are quite fragile and they can be inactivated quite easily with, with disinfectants. Um, you might be hearing a, a bit about, you know, DNA fragments being, being found in, or COVID found in wastewater and feces. These are normally non infected in fact, they are non-infectious uh, DNA fragments. So you won't be, we won't, catch COVID from, from those. Um, so because of that, the risk of transmission of COVID and, and vi the virus from feces appears to be, to be very low. Um, so so we, we shouldn't be um, worrying a lot about uh, transmission of COVID from sanitation systems. Um, just to tell you a bit about what we know about uh, survival of coronaviruses in general on um, on surfaces and in different media. Um, there's, so what you're seeing here is the survival times in different conditions uh, in tap water and sewage and up, um, in, uh, on, on a cotton gown, for example. This evidence has been moving quite quickly recently and the survival on surfaces you see there is quite a long uh, window, two hours to, to nine days. What we're recently kind of discovering is that the median half-life is around 1.2 hours, which means it doesn't last that long on surfaces and reinforces that we really need to be focusing on stopping transmission from respiratory droplets. So people, people coughing and, um, and, and immediate contact uh, you know, in, the, in the short duration. So, so droplets, ventilation is, um, um, but of course, that doesn't mean that, that hand hygiene is any less important. We need to, to keep doing that as well. Um, now, specifically on, we're talking about sanitation today. So the presence of the virus in water and wastewater. So the infectious COVID had not been de de detected in drinking water supplies. You're not going to catch it from, from drinking water. Um, there's also been, uh, infectious COVID has not been detected in treated or untreated sewage. So what we are seeing in these studies is um, a small amount of uh, DNA, frag or sorry, RNA fragments, um, which are non-infectious. So um, the risk from drinking water supplies and sanitation services is, is low. We do need to be take care of sanitation and the risk of person-to-person -person transmission while while they're at work. 
So all of the existing uh, guidance applies and you see a picture here of the, the sanitation and health guidelines, which is our main technical resource on sanitation and health. Um, I want to talk now a little bit about wastewater surveillance because many of you may have heard of these, these uh, interesting studies actually that are finding uh, the, the RNA fragments of, of COVID in wastewater and using that to, to learn something about what is happening with this, this epidemic. And so this, you can, in this map here, you can see the many places that are doing this, this surveillance of COVID and, and wastewater. Um, and it's actually it's a really interesting hypothesis. It's been used, you know, quite effectively actually in the, the polio eradication program. So there is a good precedent for it. Um, but at the moment, before we really understand how this can tell us something that we don't know from testing in humans and contact tracing, we need to to make sure this this research matures a bit so that we understand more about the sampling, the analytical methods, some of the modeling and interpretation, um, and making sure that it, that it adds value in addition to, to other kinds of surveillance. But it does look like there's some, some a promising use case for a, an early warning of, of um, uh, maybe a second wave, that maybe as much as three to even 10 days early warning. Um, so this is, this is one of the ways that this research may be may be used. Um, but in the meantime, we need to absolutely make sure that people are not um, misunderstanding this risk and, and worrying about uh, uh, getting contracting COVID from, from wastewater, especially we don't want workers to be afraid to come to work because of that. Um, and we need to make sure that service providers are, are able to focus on, on keeping the taps running, you know, and, and enabling that hand washing and um, those essential services. Okay, so I just want to pivot now a little bit to, to some of our existing guidance on sanitation and health. Um, you can go to our website and you will find these guidelines that were published just a year ago or year and a half ago. Um, I don't have time to give you all of the details today, but you'll find a huge amount of information there on, on uh, sanitation and health around the, the basic recommendations, the um, implementation guidance, as well as technical supporting resources. So I would encourage you to, to look at that. Um, in the time available, I just want to give you a really quick overview of the main recommendations that are in here for sanitation. The so first is around making sure that absolutely everybody has a toilet. So not you know some people in the community, but everybody in, in the community with a minimum level of service, a safe toilet that contains excreta, and making sure that we're not thinking about just providing uh, the technology, like toilets, but, but using the supply and demand side approaches concurrently so that we have the facilities and people are using them. And of course, that's not just at home, but in all settings. Um, the evidence really shows if we want to have an impact on health, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, but we have, it's not just about people having toilets. We have to get excreta out of communities and, um, and, and really a whole safe sanitation chain um, using a whole lot of different technologies, actually. Not one technology is not necessarily better than the other. It's very context specific. And um, WHO recommends use making those investments using a, a risk assessment and management approach. So for us, that's that sanitation safety planning, and you're going to hear about other risk assessment tools today, you know, like uh, SFDs, which give you a really good city level picture of what's, what's happening and more detailed tools like SANIPA. Um, but absolutely, we need to consider the special risks for sanitation workers within that as well. I think I'm getting close to time, so I, I'll hurry. But um, you know, sanitation, of course, needs to, to work alongside other urban services to ensure that they're both efficient and sustainable. Um, and we need to really make sure the health sector is doing their job. So that doesn't mean that the health sector should be delivering sanitation, but there's some really specific functions that they need to, to take up to make sure that sanitation investments really make a difference for health. Um, so there's, there's a whole recommendation area around that. Okay, um, 
just to really quickly point you to a whole lot of supporting resources here around that kind of dig in deeper on those recommendations. You'll find those at those links. I hope we can share the, the um, presentation with the links afterwards. Um, but finally, just to, to go back to, you know, what can, what can you do um, with all of this? So first, as I said earlier, really making sure you're an advocate to, to make sure that WASH is included within the COVID country plans, really focus on the hand hygiene aspects of it in the immediate term, but also long-term hygiene improvements and around water availability and all of the places that we need to wash our hands. Healthcare facilities, super important, especially where patients are being treated. So wash for basic infection prevention and control in health facilities, absolutely critical. Um, we need to strengthen our support to sanitation workers. You know, we, we see a lot of, you know, health workers, you know, being made heroes of in the COVID. Uh, and of course, they, they absolutely are. But we need to, to think about um, these other like, basic people. Um, services like cleaning and hospitals, sanitation work in communities, uh, uh, fecal sludge um, service providers and, and treatment plants. All of these, these people need to be taken care of at work to, with, with uh, protective gear as well as um, social and legal protections. Um, and, and that's you know, critical because we, we have, absolutely have to have this continuity of services um, for, for WASH. So, so really kind of focusing your efforts around those five things, depending on, on what your role is, is, is what we're recommending. Um, before I close, and I you know, hope this is going to give us all a, um, some momentum at our backs, uh, is the, the um, SDG6 Global Acceleration Framework, which is going to be launched tomorrow. Um, so look out for that. This is this is really trying to push for the highest level for um, for uh, for investment and more aligned action on on uh, SDG six. So I see Suresh is there. I think my time is up. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Kate, for an interesting presentation. Uh, what we have done is we have kept the question and answer sessions toward the end. Uh, however, we are expecting that if participants could uh, write the questions in the question and answer tab, which is next to chat and not in the chat box, we will have a record of all the questions. And please write your name, city, and the speaker to whom the questions are posted. So we will pick up towards the end in the question and answer session. So thank you, Kate, for this interesting presentation. Uh, Marine, you can introduce the next speaker before we yes. go on. So now, this is a this is a joint presentation by two of the speakers. One is the eminent Mr. Doc, Dr. Abdul Abdullah Al Moeed. He heads the uh, policy and advocacy unit of Water Aid Bangladesh, and um, this. The co-speaker um, for this um, presentation is Bitush Luthra. He's the program manager at CSC India. And the topic of presentation is shit flow diagram, assessment of excreta management for better sanitation planning and monitoring progress. Thanks, Perry. And uh, I'll take one minute to talk about Muid and his experience he brings from, you know, He's a development professional with specialized work experience in both academic and professional uh, experience in water and sanitation sector. He has proven experience in managing large scale environmental and water sanitation projects targeting poor and vulnerable population in the context of Bangladesh. Dr. Muid works with different development and corporate partners, including ministries and departments of government of Bangladesh. And we have a long engagement with water aid. We have worked on rainwater harvesting, wastewater issues, and now on people's touch management issues. And uh, then my colleague, Bitush Lutra, who is the co-presenter in this. Uh, Bitush holds an environmental engineering postgraduate degree from IIT Kanpur. He is involved in research and training on the subject related to decentralized wastewater treatment and supply management. 
and he has interest in the area of sanitation, water, and wastewater, and he is the lead and coordinator of the SFD work with me in Center for Science and Environment, New Delhi. So, Vitush and Mohit, this is the time for you. 20 minutes, share your experience and learning as uh, from India and Bangladesh, and what are the learnings from SFD? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so, without wasting any time, uh, I would uh, start my presentation. Uh, so, it's called Assessment of Excreta Management through SFDs or Shit Flow Diagram. So, uh, the first question we should ask ourselves, why did we need uh, something called shit flow diagram at all? Uh, the answer is because uh, if you look at the past, how we have tried to solve the problem of sanitation is through single-mindedly uh, following centralized sewerage systems or uh, systems which are only and only catering to very few part of the population of the city. So. So the, so the status quo has been that there has been strong focus on the sewerage systems. Uh, and most urban uh, dwellers with sanitation access are dependent on on-site systems. So uh, this, this also actually uh, came out uh, uh, when we did a lot of shit flow diagrams that uh, less than 10% urban Africa uh, is dependent on sewerage and less than 30% South Asia has an access to sewer systems. Uh, another thing which uh, kind of uh, 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 tilts our understanding towards I mean, sewerage systems is that uh, the on-site systems are temporary solutions. And uh, someday or the other, uh, everybody should have or will have an access to uh, a sewerage or a centralized system. So that is also a thought process which has been uh, kind of ingrained in our education system as well. And then uh, a lot of times uh, we see these projects getting implemented and only uh, contribute to a very few percentage of the population. The reason is we don't have data on ground. So uh, the data on sanitation uh, is merely collected in terms of whether we have a toilet or not. Uh, and we are still, though uh, we are living in the era of sustainable development goals, but uh, only lately we realized that access to toilet was also that important. Another reason uh, uh, the, the, the shift towards centralized system is because uh, we tend to fail to manage the whole service, sanitation service chain. We just look at access to toilet and that's about it. And that's another reason. Uh, so uh, these were the reasons why we realized that there, there should be a communication tool which can convey the actual situation on ground regarding sanitation of a city. And it's, it started with these two papers, which you can see on your screen uh, by WSP. So a group of institutions came together, uh, uh, excuse me for using an older logo, but back then it was WSP of World Bank, GIZ, uh, Susana, University of Leeds, WEDEC, uh, CSE, EAWAG, and BMGF. So these institutes came together to uh, brainstorm how can we convey the situation on ground in a much better way. So, uh, so therein uh, actually the, the birth of SFD happened. Uh, so uh, so just, just to give you a brief, uh, this actually is a very effective communication and advocacy tool, uh, which uh, is able to convey a complex situation on ground in a much better way. Uh, it's, it's a tool for engineers, planners, decision makers uh, to, uh, of course, understand the situation in a much better way. It is based on contributing populations and not exact milliliters or megaliters of sewage or megatons or tons of fecal sludge. It represents the, uh, the public health hazard and it also gives an overview uh, on the sanitation uh, priorities one should have. Having said that, uh, it's, uh, it's just not the graphic. Uh, the graphic has to be read with a report which gives us clearly the, the source of data and the, uh, the assumptions which were taken to develop the graphic, which is the SFD graphic and the narrative report. So the narrative report also kind of gives us an idea of the, uh, the service delivery the enabling environment.
environment of the service delivery context is also conveyed in the, the report. So this is the master uh, SFD. I'll just spend a minute on this. If you see at the top, we have the whole uh, sanitation service chain, the containment, emptying, transport, treatment. And on the left column, you would see uh, the three broad ways uh, excreta in a city might travel. Uh, off-site sanitation, on-site sanitation, and open defecation. So off-site sanitation would include our sewerage systems and also uh, if the toilet is directly connected to some kind of a closed drain or an open drain, whereas on-site sanitation system will include uh, systems like septic tanks, pit latrines, twin pits, and open defecation, I think everybody knows. And if you see, uh, we uh, uh, have three variables uh, uh, that we use in shit flow diagram. One is WW or wastewater, the other is FS or fecal sludge, and the third is supernatant or SN. Uh, the supernatant is a very late entry to the SFD, but we realize it's a very important component because most of the containment systems or on-site sanitation systems uh, are actually overflowing in open drains. The liquid component, when the solid liquid separation partially happens in these uh, on-site sanitation systems, the, the liquid flows through the whole city in these drains. And this liquid we kind of uh, gave the name as a supernatant. Now, if you see uh, on this diagram, it, uh, the, the width of arrow actually, uh, so maybe on the next slide, I'll explain on that. So as you see, uh, we have the service chain at the top and uh, the three uh, ways of excreta can flow. Uh, the name of the city is right at the top, service chain, offsite, onsite, open defecation. If you see the width of the boxes, it is kind of representing the percentage of population dependent on those systems. And if you see, there were only two uh, colored arrows. One was red and one was green. Uh, the arrow, the red arrow, of course, uh, uh, would denote its unsafe management of excreta. And the only question we ask at each stage is whether the excreta is contained or not. And we have kind of defined uh, all these terminologies uh, in the shit flow diagram. What do you mean by contained and a not contained system? So if the answer is it's a contained system, the, the color of the arrow would look as green. And if the answer is that this is a system which is not contained, which means that there is some pathway of uh, pathogen transmission, that means it is a not contained system. And then it means the color of the arrow would be red. So uh, that's about the, the graphic. Uh, uh, CAC has done a lot of uh, uh, shit flow diagrams in India and beyond. And uh, we have all the tools available uh, on this website called sfd.susana.org. If you see, there is this button of uh, uh, graphic generator. Uh, that's the tool which we use to develop shit flow diagram. We need to enter certain data to it uh, throughout the chain and then uh, with the press of a button, you get the, the diagram for the city you are making the SFD for. If you see worldwide, a lot of SFDs have been done. This is give, just to give you uh, some idea that around uh, 118 SFDs have been reviewed and uploaded on this Susana platform. So talking about India's story, uh, uh, I would like to cover a little bit of applications of SFD. Once you've done the SFD for a city, what all you can do. Uh, there is, uh, of course, you can do, uh, you can sensitize the decision makers. You could uh, do better city sanitation planning. You could actually use smaller city SFDs into one state level SFD. So we did the one uh, 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 study of 66 uh, cities in uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is the most populous state of India, where we had developed SFDs for 66 cities. And using those 66 uh, cities SFD, we generated one uh, state level SFD uh, for the state of UP, which clearly conveyed how uh, good or bad the management of excreta is in the state. And that uh, in a way contributed to the state to develop uh, a policy level document uh, which on, on fecal sludge management. Um, similarly, we have used it for city sanitation planning. We have used it to uh, do uh, 
um, do advocacy for uh, decision makers. So, so to do advocacy for uh, on-site sanitation management at the decision making level. Having said that, we have also tried uh, monitoring the progress of cities through SFDs, which we will be talking a uh, little later. This is just to give you a, a snapshot. Uh, uh, it has been, the SFDs have been used at uh, different levels. Uh, of lately, this uh, uh, advisory was issued by the government of India, which is uh, advisory on on-site and off-site sewage management practices. This also uh, encourages uh, all the cities to develop SFDs to monitor the progress they are doing with respect to sanitation. On the left bottom, you would see uh, uh, there is a national uh, level organization called Namami Gange or National Mission for Clean Ganga, which has been uh, uh, funding a lot of sewage treatment projects throughout the Ganga Basin. Uh, but when we kind of went ahead to, to have meetings with NMCG along with an SFD of uh, one of the towns in the basin, we could uh, do the advocacy to uh, uh, make them uh, kind of fund a project, a fecal sludge project in, in Ganga. That was the first project they could, uh, they actually funded for uh, fecal sludge management. Uh, so uh, of course the SFD contributed. And at the top you can see uh, Bill Gates meeting uh, Prime Minister Modi and he discussed the sanitation situation in India with a shake flow diagram. So uh, this I've always uh, covered about city sanitation planning in the Ganga Basin, we have used SFDs. This, uh, which, this is the 66 city study, which I was referring to. And if you see on the rightmost column, uh, uh, you can easily observe how uh, the dependence on on-site sanitation systems is in the cities. If you see, there are four clusters we are talking about. Uh, the cluster four is the smallest cities. Cluster three is a little bigger. Cluster two, they're bigger than those. And cluster one is the biggest uh, of them all. And as you move from the smaller city to the larger cities with respect to population, you would see uh, how the dependence from on-site is moving towards off-site systems. But if you look at the extreme right column, you would realize that smaller cities a major chunk of population dependent on site systems, but they don't get better sanitation systems because of XYZ reasons. But the strict flow diagram clearly conveys this uh, uh, story of the city to the decision makers. And then uh, of course, uh, you can see the changes on the decision making. This is the, uh, the, the state level SFD, which I was talking about, uh, kind of adding up all the 66 SFDs, we could generate this state level SFD which again clearly uh, shows that how uh, more than 50, 60% population is dependent on on-site sanitation system, despite all the investments which have been done uh, on off-site system. We've been only able to cater to, in terms of access to sewer systems, only 30%, but with respect to treatment, you can say only 14% or 16%. So this was uh, something I wanted to share from the India's perspective. And now I would uh, um, request my colleague here to share the Bangladesh story with us. Over to you, Muit. Okay, thank you, Vitush, uh, for making the very comprehensive presentation on SFT. Okay, so let's uh, look uh, at the Bangladesh story. Uh, yeah. The actually, uh, the all the SFDs by this time, everyone knows that it's the game of red and green. And uh, today's story is how uh, we make some example of uh, making this uh, red to green. That's the journey I would like to depict today. So a uh, very specific example, that's why I have chosen uh, here. And uh, we started uh, our fecal sludge uh, management initiative in a small town, uh, which is in Shakipur during 2015. And during 2016 onwards, uh, we tried to maintain the whole sanitation uh, value chain. Uh, and uh, during that part, uh, of course, uh, Vitush, I am controlling here, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, the SFD has a lot of influence uh, 
in this whole sanitation service chain and in the whole circular economical aspect from cradle to grave concept. That means from containment part to transportation treatment part or even at the reuse part. So I'm not going in details of this, uh, how the treatment we are doing in that uh, Shakipur plant, but let's look how the SFD heat flow diagram has been implemented there in the Shakipur co-composting plant. So the journey started, as I mentioned, during 2015, and definitely at that time, uh, the SFD that represented here shows everything red. That means 100% unsafely managed. And once, you know, before the construction of that uh, uh, co-composting plant in Shakipur, we had a lot of discussion with the municipality and definitely this SFD was the icebreaker. And uh, there is a dream to make uh, the greener Bangladesh. And uh, once this uh, raid, you know, we... And uh, this raid zone actually gives us a lot of information, as Vitush mentioned, what type of toilets, where are they? And we found that about 90% of the toilets uh, are pit toilet in Shakipur, and 35% uh, of the roads are not accessible by even the smallest vacuum truck. That means the one cubic meter vacuum truck. But the rest of the roads network, uh, which actually accessible, and um, that's why a small uh, one cubic meter vacuum truck is quite enough at that municipality, even though usually the municipals request uh, for a very, you know, large vacuum truck uh, for the municipality operation. But this sort of, you know, very specific example helped uh, for the systematic optimization and tool. Uh, you know, developed on a uh, very local level capacity. Um, it has a dream, right? And uh, not only we didn't stop in 2015, but uh, we, you know, we, we developed some prototype uh, SFD, how we could reach to the 100% of the safely managed sanitation. And towards this journey, uh, of course, I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, collaborators that need to be paved like it, it could be the agricultural, environmental, health, energy. But for Shokipur, since we produce the compost at the end for the reuse in the agricultural purpose, so the stagnant or the stringent collaborators is the agricultural ministry. And that's what we have a very strong collaboration with them to make it happen and to uh, how to reuse this compost and to implement, to apply it in the agricultural field for, you know, as uh, organic fertilizer. Uh, definitely the financing part is always interesting. And uh, since it is the municipalities led approach and it, after the journey that has started from 2016, uh, you know, a lot of uh, fund, you know, how much will be required in each year that has been estimated. And that can be, you know, pitched towards the increase of the total, uh, you know, budget uh, uh, generation or budget increment of the municipality. So this is a very advocacy, you know, very strong advocacy tool to, uh, you know, uh, to make the demand of the more finance as required to make a paved path uh, according to the timeline. The more, I mean, the uh, important thing is the monitoring, how we are using that uh, SFD tool as a monitoring tool. And uh, very frankly, uh, uh, at the very uh, first year of this 2016, we got the 15% of this, uh, you know, green out of this 100% uh, trade. In the second year, it uh, reaches to 36%, from 15 to 36%. And um, at the middle of the third year, that means in 2018 middle, so it reaches to 43%. And that's how actually this uh, green becomes, uh, you know, quite a greener one day by day. And this is how the safely managed sanitation can be paved uh, to reach SDG 6. And uh, definitely once we develop this for Shakipur, local level uh, capacity has been developed and the local level troubleshooter, that is very important. 
the you know those troubleshooters are very critical to troubleshoot whenever there is some operating operation and maintenance issue so what we say always that this is made for shakipur and definitely it is the you know onm all sort of troubleshooting and once we develop this whole value uh, you know chain and have a dream from red towards green and ultimate green towards the timeline it has a scope for the replication in a uh, long large scale and that's what we are doing uh, in another municipality in sayadpur uh, where it is a quite uh, five times quite bigger than the chakipur municipality and uh, definitely we are following the city wide inclusive sanitation approach there so another big dream has just uh, paved there and uh, once we have that replication example uh, definitely in chakipur the people are very important this is the most interesting story i believe in chakipur like um, once we started in 2016 all the sanitation workers or workers uh, who work there are male initially they are engaged and uh, for the first quarter that means three months uh, of course uh, you know the treatment capacity even though it was quite higher but uh, we reached 2% green and uh, in the next quarter of this 2016 that means second quarter it uh, goes to another 3% so altogether 5% and uh, then we actually think about how to tweak this situation very interestingly um, some of the workers were engaged uh, i mean the from female and um, from 100% we actually it uh, we increased actually engaged the female colleagues 25% and in, and it increased you know for the next next six months to 10% so this is a quite an interesting thing that how even though the sanitation workers is very difficult you know to engage and when we engage some female colleagues there the productivity has increased and it has a lot of link with the you know profitability loss efficiency and everything and more is interesting thing is uh, you know during the 2017 uh, it has uh, and until the middle of 20 Uh, 18 it reaches to 43% but at the middle of 2018 we decided to reduce uh, some of our workers for the system optimization that's what we believe that how to make more operation and maintenance cost as a sustainable one so but we kept this ratio 75 20% ratio uh, in our uh, co composting plan but we reduced 20% of our worker there and even after that uh, you know we get additional 7% uh, in the uh, middle by the middle of uh, 2018 so all together is the 43% the sheet flow diagram what is present uh, in the sudanas website at by the middle of 2018 uh, i would like to mention one thing in our plan uh, uh you know a physically challenged uh, worker is also working there and he is so much efficient and this is a very heart touching story for me and learning from my end also that if we involve them if we guide them if we give them proper you know technical knowledge and develop the capacity probably we could get more higher efficiency if we can engage the female number one female workers there and also the physically challenged workers uh, in in the uh, business of sanitation however uh, you know during the 2019 20 there are a lot of stories remaining that will be you know told later on uh, based on the sort analysis how the research can be flown and gender and uh, most importantly the quality of the compost and keeping those in the parking lot for some other day i would like to mention also here uh, another story of the dhaka city which is a you know <laughs> very challenging situation uh, exists in dhaka city and um, uh, if we consider the dhaka city's sfd only the 3% uh, you know is green there and more interestingly the dhaka wasa which is the responsible one for the sewerage service authority you know in the dhaka city uh, 
uh, has a plan to make 100% sewerage by 2025. And um, I am just making one example of Dhaka, but we have four Wasas, Dhaka, Chittagong, Kulna, and Rashahi, who have the responsible for providing this sewerage service. And uh, most importantly, I mean, such dream, if we consider that, you know, for the Dhaka city, they will reach 100% uh, safely managed sanitation by 2025 if they can make it. But uh, throughout this process, actually, they didn't uh, get any sort of uh, green from the red. So that makes a challenging question towards us. And when we tried to unfold that, we found that even uh, in the last budget allocation, the uh, you know, cumulative budget allocation for these four wasas is about is fifty one percent of the total allocation of the you know uh, uh, wash budget under the subhead of the water sanitation and FSM. That means you know these four wasas are getting a lot of resources, but uh, probably the sewage solution is not only the solution that. He gives a clear picture from this SFD. Wait, and, can you summarize, please? Right, and the, of course, uh, the you know the uh, the, uh, the 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 we need to unfold this more meticulously, and I'm sure that Christine's presentation will entail those things. Thank you so much. And this raid, uh, we have a very big dream to turn it from red to green. And definitely, even though there is some Corona crisis now. I would like to, you know, mention that uh, please stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Moit, for the interesting presentation. And thanks, Pitush, for the interesting overview of what SFD means and how we have been able to manage some change in policies and processes and uh, creating an enabling framework. So, Mehreen, can you move on to the next one? Yeah. Uh, yes. In the meantime, I request all the participants to put Can their questions to in the question and share box. Uh, and if any panelist wants to answer live, they can go there in the question answer box and also answer because there are, I can see a lot of questions coming up. Uh, they can use this time to answer a few of the questions. We will try to, so, yes. Our next presenter is Dr. Christine Mao. She is the professor of safe water and sanitation in the Roland School of Public Health and the director of the Center for Global Safe Water, Sanitation, Hygiene at Emory University, USA. Her topic of presentation is SAMIPATH, Exposure Assessment of Fetal Contamination in Urban, res in urban Residential Environments. Thank you, Marine. And uh, you can stop sharing the screen. And I, in the meantime, I introduce uh, Christine further. Uh, Christine, are you ready? Christine has over 40 years of her uh, professional experience focusing primarily on environmental transmission of infectious agents, in particular foodborne and waterborne diseases. Her field research in Bangladesh, Bolivia, Cambodia, China, Ethiopia, Ghana, Honduras, India, Kenya, Punjab, and the global south. You know, there's a long list of countries where she has worked during her professional uh, career. So she looks into the water quality in the water distribution systems, water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, in the healthcare facilities. So, Christine, 20 minutes, take your time and share with us the learnings from Sanipath in urban residential environment. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suresh. So, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you. And uh, it's truly a pleasure to have this opportunity to participate in this webinar. And a special thanks to Dr. Suresh Rahila for inviting me to give this presentation. And I want to start by pointing out that I am presenting on behalf of a large um, SANIPATH team of researchers. So just quickly an overview of this presentation, I'm going to talk about what are exposure assessments? Why are they useful? What can we learn from them? And then I will tell you about the SANIPATH tool and the objectives for why to use this tool and the methods of the tool. And then I'm going to focus on our key findings from Dhaka, Bangladesh, which Muid has already um, introduced. And finally wrap up by talking about how these results 
can inform municipal and national policies and programming. So we have just had a wonderful introduction to shit flows diagrams. This is the diagram from Dhaka, Bangladesh from a few years ago. And what we see is that 98% or 97% of fecal sludge is not safely managed. And what we focus on in the SaniPath tool is this part here. What happens to this 97 or 98% that goes into the residential environment? What are the public health risks from having excreta in the environment? Where does it go and how do people get exposed to it? And what do public health authorities need to know in order to protect public health? So what information does local government need in order to address this situation? So we recognize that inadequate sanitation leads to multiple exposure pathways. And as we think about fecal contamination in the residential environment, we realize that there are many different types of exposure pathways, or you can think of them as transmission routes for pathogens. Most of you have probably seen some version of this F diagram before, and it shows the sources of the pathogens in human and animal excreta, how these pathogens move and enter different compartments of the environment, and then how food, drinking water, and hands can become contaminated with fecal pathogens and serve as vehicles for transmission to other humans. These photos illustrate examples of these exposure pathways that we have seen in our urban study settings and may look like places where you work. And here I want to point out that some of these exposure pathways are through direct ingestion. So ingestion of contaminated drinking water or contaminated street food or uh, produce, raw produce such as tomatoes or lettuce that may have been irrigated with wastewater or through direct uh, mouth contact with fomites, objects with fecal contamination. For some of these other pathways, the exposure is indirect. So it's through contact with water in open drains or contaminated ocean or surface water or contaminated soil or contaminated surfaces on public, in public latrines or flood water. So many different pathways of exposure. But when you have these different pathways, it's important to identify which ones are in the environment and which exposures pose the greatest risk. Because of our work in um, different parts of the world, we've come to realize that children may actually be surrounded by fecal contamination in their environment and often come into contact with fecal contamination in their daily lives. So the SaniPath tool focuses on these environmental pathways in the public domain to identify these pathways and understand which ones pose the greatest risk. This tool is based on in-depth research that we have conducted in Ghana and has been further refined through multiple deployments of the tool in different settings. So I want to just talk a little bit about this idea of exposure assessment. So here in this top diagram, we see a hypothetical situation with four fecal exposure pathways. And together, they contribute to the cumulative exposure to fecal contamination here on this figure that I'm pointing to. So cumulative exposure to the on the x-axis, and because of this exposure, you have an increasing burden of enteric disease. And at some point, you may reach a saturation where the child is always exposed to fecal contamination, and they may experience a high burden of enteric infection or disease. One key point to notice here, though, is that not all of these pathways are contributing equal to fecal exposure. 
So down here in the left-hand side, you see that some pathways such as pathway A may only contribute to a small proportion of the total fecal exposure. And an intervention that targets pathway A may reduce the cumulative exposure to some extent, but not enough to actually make an impact on the burden of enteric disease because this cumulative exposure is still very high. But here on the right-hand diagram, if we intervened in a pathway such as pathway B, which is a major contributor to the total exposure to fecal contamination, this could make a large difference in reducing cumulative exposure to fecal contamination. And we would expect to see then a reduction in the burden of enteric disease. So one of our goals with the fecal exposure assessment is identifying all of the pathways in a specific context and then identifying which are the dominant pathways where if you make an intervention on that dominant pathway that you would see a greater reduction in total fecal exposure. So the overall goal of the SANI path exposure assessment is to provide evidence for urban sanitation advocacy and investment decisions. So like the shit flow diagrams that we just heard about, these are an important advocacy tool. They can identify and assess the public health risks related to poor sanitation and fecal sludge management. They can be used to raise awareness about these risks among stakeholders, and then this information can help prioritize sanitation investments and policies based on those exposures that pose the greatest risk to public health. How do we measure exposure to fecal contamination? Well, we realize that exposure is really the interaction between the contamination in the environment and people's behavior. So where in the environment is there fecal contamination and what is the magnitude of that contamination? So we work to collect environmental samples and usually we measure fecal indicator bacteria like E. coli because this is feasible by simple field methods. Measuring the pathogens in environmental samples is expensive and it requires some advanced lab capacity, but I will show you some data about that in DACA. The other information we want to understand is how do people come into contact with fecal contamination? So who comes into contact? Is that adults or children? And we know that adults and children have different behavior. We also look now at different behaviors between males and females. And what type of behavior are we trying to understand? So some of it is deliberate ingestion of raw vegetables, of street food, of drinking water, and perhaps soil. But also we're interested in potential for accidental ingestion of surface waters when someone is swimming or has contact with surface waters or accidental ingestion of bathing water or animal feces such as young children may have. And then also contact with drain water or flood water. And then how often do these behaviors take place? So that's the information that we try to collect about behavior. This concept of exposure assessment doesn't only apply to enteric diseases, but it can also be used when thinking about interventions to prevent exposure to COVID-19 infection and disease. So for both of these, for disease to occur, you must first have exposure to the pathogen that causes the infection. And that exposure, again, is determined by what is in the environment, where are there pathogens in the environment and the behavior that brings people into contact with those pathogens. In order to change the exposure or the risk of disease outcome, you can alter the environment or you can alter behavior or both. 
So the SANIPATH tool collects two kinds of data. It collects data on exposure behavior, so reported frequency of behavior of adults and children that may lead to exposure to fecal contamination in the environment. And we do this through household surveys, through school surveys and community surveys. And as I said, we also collect environmental samples from the relevant exposure pathways. And we analyze these for E. coli as an indicator of fecal contamination in the environment. The data on the locations and the magnitude of fecal contamination are collected at the time that these samples are collected. And the data is then combined to estimate the relative risk of exposure to fecal contamination. Here we see pictures of uh, in the field, and we have really tried to design this tool to balance resource and logistical constraints with providing valuable exposure data. So you see here that we're doing mobile data collection in different parts of the field, here in uh, classrooms in India and Bangladesh, and also outdoors in uh, community meetings and here in household interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. Here are some pictures of our collaborators collecting and analyzing the environmental samples. And I wanna point out that some of these E. coli assays are really quite portable. So you can set up a field laboratory if the facilities don't already. In this picture in the top right-hand corner, we see that our team actually set up a lab in their hotel room so that they could analyze the samples. So this type of work is feasible almost anywhere in the world. This slide, slide explains how the data from each part of the study is combined to provide an estimate of exposure for a population. So here on the left, you see the pie chart with the behavioral data from households and schools and communities that looks at the frequency of behavior. And then on the right, you see the data from the environmental contamination. This is a histogram where we have proportion of samples and on the, on the Y axis and on the X axis, you have the log of log base 10 E. coli concentration. And then these results are combined through a Bayesian analysis, statistical analysis, that takes parameters from the literature and does an analysis to um, create these people plots. So this is looking at exposure in terms of the percent of people who are exposed to fecal contamination so that's the proportion of people shown in red and the dose or the concentration of E. coli that's ingested on a monthly basis um, based on what we have measured in the environmental samples. And the magnitude of the dose is shown in the darkness of the red color. So I'll be showing you some more of these in the next couple of slides. These tools and protocols and guidance are all open source and freely available on our website, um, sanipath.org. And the platform is uh, accessed at sanipath.org where you can go and select the appropriate pathways for your local context and customize the mobile data collection forms that are used on the Kobo, Kobo Collect for mobile data collection. So that information is available for the behavior surveys, for the environmental sampling. We have videos that show how to do the laboratory analyses. Um, there's a dashboard for setting up your deployment. All of the data is then stored on the Amazon cloud. And all of the analysis is done automatically on the cloud and the final reports and uh, results are uh, generated through this analysis. So on the next slide, we see the outputs of the tool. The pie charts that show the behavior results, 
the histograms that show the results from the environmental samples, the people plots, which show the exposure assessment and the automated um, report. So now I want to show you some results and I want to highlight some of our results from DACA. So this slide shows the people plots a bit better and shows how you can compare exposure. So in this case, we see how exposure to fecal contamination in municipal drinking water varies across six neighborhoods in DACA. So here in neighborhood D, you see the highest proportion of people who are drinking municipal water with high contamination levels. You see that the color of red is very dark, that 96% of people are drinking this municipal water and the monthly estimated dose of E. coli is around 10 to the eighth E. coli um, per month. So this is very high. And this is quite a contrast to another neighborhood in Dhaka, neighborhood C, where you see that really a small proportion of people are drinking contaminated municipal water. And the dose here is much lower around 10 to the third E. coli per month. You can also look within a single community, as we see in this slide, and compare different pathways. So here we see um, using this standardized metric of uh, E. coli ingested per month, we can compare the risks from something where there's high contamination, such as uncooked produce here, versus a lower risk of using public latrines. Here, the red color is so light because the E. coli dose is so low that you can't really see the people who are exposed. So this is a nice way of using the common metric to compare these different exposures from different pathways. Christine, in one or two minutes, Oops. if you can summarize. Okay, thank you. So at 10 neighborhoods in Dhaka. Um, on the top, we see uh, neighborhoods in North Dhaka, five neighborhoods. On the bottom, we see five neighborhoods in South Dhaka. On the left is exposure for adults. On the right is exposure for children. And what you see here is that different neighborhoods have different dominant pathways. So the darker the color it shows here, the higher the total um, exposure to fecal contamination and the sizes of the boxes show the contribution of a specific pathway to total fecal exposure. So for example, in this neighborhood, drinking water is responsible for the majority of exposure to total fecal contamination, which is a contrast to another neighborhood, a wealthier neighborhood, where most of the exposure is through raw produce. So this is a nice way of comparing different risks in different neighborhoods across the whole city. Now you may ask, how does this exposure to E. coli, how does it um, relate to exposure to actual enteric pathogens? This is a study that we did in collaboration with ICDDRB and partners at University of Technology, Sydney. Um, we looked at five different pathogens and three types of samples, open drains, canals, and floodwaters. And what you see here is that we had a high frequency of pathogen detection in almost all the locations and sample types. And this is important because not only were there high frequency of detection, but also high pathogen concentrations, which is here on the Y axis for these different types of samples you see that there were high concentrations of these different pathogens. And here, young children in this neighborhood are eating and playing right next to an open drain. And you see here the discharge pipe from a septic tank. So this is really a public health concern. I want to wrap up by saying that um, we have now done this SaniPath deployment in 48 neighborhoods in 10 countries and 11 cities. We have a new deployment in progress in Durban. And to date, when we start looking at these different cities, we begin to see different pathways 
are dominant in some cities and not in others. So some cities have more problems with exposure to contaminated flood water in dark purple or to open drains in dark green. But you also see here that across many cities and neighborhoods, contaminated raw produce and street food are dominant pathways. All of us eat, and many of you may be working at the intersection of wash and nutrition. So this is an important message that we need to understand about protecting and improving food safety and understanding the links between um, poor sanitation and food contamination. So I'm just going to skip ahead here. Um, all of these slides will be available so you can look at the strengths and limitations of this tool. But I wanna to point out that now in places like Ghana, we are using the evidence from these um, SaniPath deployments to really um, make action. These are influencing public health policy, sanitation policy, where the government is intervening on issues like food safety and um, urban sanitation planning. And I want to just wrap up by showing that this SaniPath evidence is being used to guide public health response to COVID-19 in Ghana. This is in Accra, about 40% of the households rely on public toilet facilities. And so the national and municipal authorities have developed four key messages to help keep these facilities clean and safe during the COVID pandemic. I want to acknowledge that we have had many partners working with us around the world in the years that we have been doing this SANIPATH assessment. And um, thank you for your attention. And we will have this information available of our website so that you can download this uh, tool and access this and use this yourself. So please feel free to download, go to our website and also contact us. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Christine. A very interesting and you know, in-depth analysis of the on-ground situation and the risks associated with fecal contamination. Thank you very much. Uh, Mehreen, can we go down to the discussants? And I take this opportunity in the yeah. meantime to share with participants uh, that uh, CSC has been working with WHO and we uh, we run, uh, you know, training programs on sanitation and health and sanitation safety planning and water safety planning, as well as on SFDs, how to prepare SFDs. So keep and watch on www.cscindia.org where you also have uh, announcements post 10th June, we will be announcing the next uh, uh, training programs, online training programs, and there are part and full fellowships also. So those interested, please reach out to us. Thank you, Marine. And I can see on the screen, Carol's uh, turn. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, use my liberty as moderator to uh, call upon, so you can hold on, uh, Marine. Uh, Carol Islam is one of the two discussants today whom we have invited. He is the uh, regional director for the water aid, uh, and Dr. Islam is basically uh, he has served for water aid Bangladesh for 11 years. He brings with him the position for over four decades of diverse experiences from development organizations, government agencies, nationally and internationally. As a part of South Asia uh, responsibility, he is responsible for Bangladesh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Nepal, and India operations. So, so Carol, we have been listening to these, you know. Uh, uh, international approach, guidelines, and these tools and the learnings from the ground. So I would like you as a discussion to focus upon the relevance, the risks, and the challenges in seven to eight minutes, if you can take, and then move on. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, first I would like to uh, congratulate the and thank the presenters because uh, it was so overwhelming and uh, full of learning and new thoughts and ideas that uh, I'm sure over 500 participants and seeing more than 100 questions in the chat box, close to 200. I mean, this is an overwhelming experience for me. Uh, we are familiar with both uh, SANIPATH and uh, sheet flow diagram, which is SDF 
that in collaboration with uh, CSC, I mean, um, uh, we have been conducting. Uh, but for this Carol, we are having voice break. Uh, uh, okay, so can you hear me clearly now? Yeah. Yes, okay. now it's clear. Yeah. Uh, so I think I will be. I mean, concentrating on mainly two, three points. First of all, in most of the South Asian countries, the responsibility of hygiene is not very clear. Rather, it is uh, shared by a number of different ministries. And when it is shared amongst different ministries, actually it becomes, uh, uh, no one knows who will take the lead role in, in managing those. Uh, even where the ministries have got clear mandate on sanitation, on water, hygiene falls between some of those cracks. Uh, someone thinks that it is the responsibility of the water ministry. Water ministry think it is the responsibility of the sanitation. And the... Carol, we are losing your game, on, voice. Uh, probably the internet connection fluctuating. Anyway, yeah. so that's something that the governance... Uh, approach is very critical in most of the South Asian countries if we want to achieve, you know, hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene to be critical in order to prevent and protect people from, from uh, contracting COVID-19. The second point I would like to highlight is uh, the issue of running water and piped water. Because uh, if you looked into uh, the water coverage into a number of these countries, you'll be seeing that probably in this region, I mean, India is most fortunate to have almost two thirds of the country being accessed to its piped water supply. Whereas if you calculate the entire region, probably only one third of the total population have got piped water connection. Why I'm bringing this issue, because the way we are demonstrating hand washing and hand hygiene in front of public that we need to rub both hands together and the way we need to do it, it really requires running water. And then we need to keep in mind that majority of the population don't have the access to running water. I'm not saying piped water. The difference between running water and piped water is that in most of the rural households, people collect water from tea oil or ponds or many different sources and keep it in a pitcher or certain container and subsequently use it in one hand. How do they manage then running water to wash hands, which is required for hand hygiene in rural and urban poor set setting? So this is something probably the communication expert and the development organizations are now missing how to help these community people to wash hand under running water. And there are different gadgets like, you know, tippy tap and few others, plastic companies and private industries are coming up with different solutions. And this is where private sector can play a vital role and NGOs can play a vital role by introducing different kinds of gadget in front of people so that irrespective of piped water or non-piped water, whatever water quality we have so that we can have running water in order to have proper hand washing. Very recently in four countries in the region, we have conducted a study on barriers to hand washing and we have found the price of the soap is a matter and a barrier to the uh, lowest income quintal people. Now, WHO, I mean, uh, unfortunately, Katie couldn't, uh, Kate couldn't show her last slide where she has shown that even soapy water can also serve the purpose like liquid soap. Now, the terminology really matters. Can we really call soapy water something different like liquid soap made at home? Uh, something needs to be done. Otherwise, the affordability and access to the soap by the lowest income quintal people will remain as a barrier for hand hygiene. 
my last two points would be on the surface inactivation. If the median longevity of the virus is 1.2 hours, but the way we are actually promoting waste management these days, it is becoming, uh, I mean, serious undertaking by the municipalities who are not used to manage such amount of medical waste. Even in the city of Dhaka, because of the reduced consumption, the overall garbage production has reduced substantially, but the medical waste production has gone like five to seven times. How a city corporation or a municipality manages such a huge amount of medical waste are we really circulating the right messages or not? And in the risk communication, we need to actually circulate one or two myth bluster, like do we really need huge amount of water for hand washing? Kate's last slide was 0.5 to, point, point five to 2 liters of water per day per person. The second is, do we really need drinking water quality water for hand hygiene? No, it is not. So if we can do those mid blaster actually circulated amongst the common people, probably at the time of this COVID-19 pandemic, WASH can really contribute towards health and we can really check the pandemic in a very shortest possible time. I would like to stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol, for interesting insights into the issues and the context, uh, what matters in Global South. So I take this opportunity to uh, invite uh, uh, the advisor from CPHU, Vijay Kumar Chaurasiaji. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. And Marine, in the meantime, if you can uh, share the screen. Yeah. So Vijay Chaurasia. Yes, uh, yes is uh, you know the technical advisor he heads the cphu his extensive work experience of 24 years in public health engineering water supply sewerage solid waste management and stormwater management and he has been involved in implementation implementation of national programs like swach bharat mission which is clean india amrut and smart cities program where infrastructure and network services are designed and uh, you know, we very recently, the government of India has also come out with an advisory for on-site and off-site uh, sewage management. So, Vijayji, we would like, if you can take five, seven minutes to take us through. And I also know that SFDs and other things are part of your plan for uh, mainstreaming effective, improved urban sanitation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Suresh Kumar Rohila. Uh, I first of all, I uh, congratulate CSC and partner organization for organizing this webinar on a very, very pertinent topic because uh, entire if you see the speed of uh, Corona virus spread and the people getting affected, this topic become really very, very important to discuss and take uh, whatever remedial measures are there. I would also like to welcome all participants and panelists uh, who have turned out in very large number and uh, patiently they are listening and all presentations also we have seen that is very nice. Uh, since, uh, I, I, as you mentioned, since I belong to Central Public Health and Environmental Engineering Organization, we look after water, solid waste and wastewater also. I will be touching upon that advisory and wastewater. Uh, but before that, one minute I will take to uh, just explain that uh, under this Clean India mission, we have constructed around 100 till million toilets, and that has also helped a lot in a very short span of four to five years to uh, help uh, help overcome this uh, problem. Otherwise, had this sanitation situation had not been handled, the uh, maybe situation would have been much worse. So in that case, and after once we have constructed, of course, their management is there that will be coming. And uh, uh, when I'm telling that construction of these toilets, apart from that, uh, solid waste management has also been done in a very marvelous way under Swachh Bharat Mission, Clean India Mission. And within that, if you see a number of cities has come where even in case of Indore, uh, UN is also uh, advocating that that should be role model for 53, 60 cities. And uh, 
uh, that is only one name, but there are a number of names where uh, these cities has come up as a test bed and lot of examples are available for many, many countries to learn from these experiences. And these things not to mention have helped a lot in uh, uh, improving sanitation condition and of course to uh, fight this uh, Corona uh, pandemic. Now, uh, the main thing what uh, Dr. Rohila has mentioned that in case of wastewater management, we have very recently on third only third of this July, we have launched this uh, advisory. And in that advisory, we have clearly uh, captured the region that uh, the pace at which urbanization is going on in India, like by 2030, uh, 600 million people are going to be urban and by 2050, more than 800 people are going to be urban. In that case, uh, the wastewater that is generated, that has to be taken care, otherwise it will create further health problem. So apart from that, this uh, economic activities are also going on and that is also resulting in uh, this waste generation and that has to be uh, taken care. But the problem is uh, that conventionally we have been dealing with uh, uh, this conventional sewer network and STP and uh, that of course, uh, because of uh, the planning aspect and not uh, uh, applying uh, due diligence, I will say, it has proved to be a costly affair. And that's why coverage in India, if you see with sewer network is recently uh, at present around 40% only and 60% people are still dependent on on-site sanitation systems. So in last few years, there has been a very good wave and awareness to manage these fecal matters. But in this fecal matter, the, there has been some slippage I, I find during research on that. As is clear from this presentation that FSSM is, has been considered as an economical and faster alternative to sewerage system. Here, some, something has happened because it is not that uh, uh, FSSM, but it is on-site sanitation, which I will uh, uh, go to next slide, I will show that, that these are the treatment technologies are only on-site and off-site. And if I say correctly, FSSM is a operation and maintenance of septic tank so that septic tank keep on performing well. And uh, if we don't do definitely that wastewater will go to drain our uh, soap pit and uh, it will create another problem. But to, but what has happened in place of on-site sanitation, people more, uh, more have bent upon constructing in standalone fecal sludge treatment plants. The problem with that is that fecal sludge treatment plant, if we see, uh, please go to next slide. If, you, if we see the percentage of waste uh, uh, pollution load it is handling compared to whatever is entering as a uh, sewage in the system and then what is going out and what is accumulated in the sludge and that sludge is being taken and treated. So contribution is only 1% in overall pollution load reduction. That I will explain with these two slides. This first slide just to draw a similarity and for easy understanding I have taken where a well-known waste stabilization plant whatever raw sewage is coming, that in uh, mm -hmm. first chamber, uh, if I say 30% uh, it is uh, digested anaerobically, then in facultative pond, another 30% reduce. And then in maturation pond, uh, once it is living around 15% is there. So this is the entire uh, that digestion is taking place in the anaerobic facultative and maturation pond. But the sludge, if you see in the bottom uh, bottom picture uh, near anaerobic, uh, anaerobic world, this sludge that is accumulated, if uh, it is cleaned around once in a year or sometimes uh, once in two years. So these things, if we consider uh, that uh, particular strength of BOD, I'm giving only example, there are many parameters. So in overall sewage that is entering with BOT 100, its contribution is only 1%. This is for simplicity, please go to next slide. There, here, is, here is the problem, what is happening? That rather than emphasizing holistically on on-site sanitation, what we have done that uh, if you see in first chamber when sewage is entering, 
POD is reducing, let us say, uh, approximately 30%, and then it is going to next, by the time it is leaving septic tank, 50% is digested and remaining 49% it is going out then the sludge that is being taken out of FSSM process, it is again containing only 1% of BOT. This calculation I will tell how we have done. If we take a specific uh, a BOT of let us say 300 that is entering into sewage, then once- Yes, your voice is breaking. One, uh, okay, now it is clear. Then now it is clear. Uh, hello. Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay, it's okay. Marine, can so, you hear him? Yes, sir. Yes. So then, then once in three yeah, years, no. once we, once in three years, once we uh, uh, suck this septage and bring to uh, a, a fecal stress treatment plant, so we have taken its volume and its specific strength, and based on that ratio divided by total, it is entering. This contribution on pollution road reduction is coming only 1%. And the bigger problem that is 49% going out of the septic tank is actual problem which is not taken care because uh, as per CSC study also in UP, it is less than 20% cases only septic tank is available. Center for Policy Research in India has carried out in many cities there it is 10 to 15% only coming. So if this is the situation of septic tank, majority of them is going to drain and that is flowing openly and going and discharge wherever low-lying area or some water body or local body. That is the important thing that has to be taken care of. then in the area that uh, uh, sanitation will come. But uh, this is what I want to emphasize that rather than uh, emphasizing only 1% that is uh, covered under pollution load covered under FSSM, this aspect which is going out of septic tank that also need to be given due weightage and due focus should be given and it is not FSSM but it is on-site sanitation which should be given emphasis, then only environmental condition of the houses or area which is dependent on on-site sanitation will be improved. Just please go to the next one. Next slide, please. Ah, yes. So here, whatever I have mentioned, that only I have uh, summarized that uh, uh, out of two options that is there, I think all these things I have summarized. So we have to take this in right perspective and in case of third point, if you see, in case of on-site sanitation, periodic inspection of on-site sanitation facility, either by ULB or the State Pollution Control Board or whosoever authority is there, that should be taken care. Increasingly, in cases where new septic tanks are constructed, the standards should be, uh, they should be more made aware about the standards and uh, missions also should be trained so that they should not uh, create very large septic tanks. I have uh, seen from this Center for Policy Research study that people are creating in place of one cubic meter for a family of five, 16 cubic meter capacity septic tank so that throughout life they need not to clear. Even average cleaning type I found there is 13 years. So those, those things has to be tackled and wherever intervention is required so that they properly perform and sanitation condition improve. Now uh, I will I will uh, leave this presentation here. Only I wanted to convey this particular point. But in the advisory, I would like to mention that adequate focus has been given on on-site treatment method because a sewerage system will take some time to come in between. If due intervention is done on on-site sanitation system, lot of improvement will be there. And my particular focus is that whatever effluent is going from septic tank that has to be treated either like Mr. Luthra mentioned uh, uh, decentralized waste management plants, similarly constructed wasteland or uh, maybe phyto read or different technologies should, we should uh, have confluence with the, uh, this local environment and they, they can treat also this whatever effluent is there. That aspect has been taken. Apart from that, Integrated planning is very important because in one O in many city in India at the time of Jenanwaram, entire city they have planned to go with sewage system. So fund was consumed in only few parts or few uh, areas. So that uh, a 
judicious uh, decision has to be taken that based on density and importance, sewage system should be limited in one area, other should be on-site sanitation and with rise in density or availability of resources, that sewage system keep on extending because that is the robust and tested solution. And accordingly, uh, the other systems which are available on on-site, they will be slowly, slowly covered with sewage system. Unless we follow this approach, then in one go, if we plan and pose a very big amount to government, it is not possible for government to spare fund. And that planning itself is faulty and it leaves us nowhere. So uh, apart Thank from you, that, Georgia, I think, yeah. uh, just one minute, one minute. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, this sit flow diagram also very important in tracking that from where uh, sewage is originating and where it is going and accordingly, customized treatment has to be provided. Those aspects also has been given. Apart from that, various aspects for uh, uh, strengthening the on-site treatment methods and uh, how to uh, make it as a sustainable system capacity building. All those aspects have been covered in detail. I request everybody to go through that whenever they get time. And if there are some suggestions, they can write to us so that we can further enrich it. Uh, thank you very much with this. I'll take thank you. And uh, thank I you, Vijay. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, there was uh, some technical problem. Five minutes I was offline. I don't know whether I lost something. But however, I think as a moderator, I found all the presentations and the discussions very insightful. And thank you very much. Uh, I would request, you know, though we have received, I was seeing last when on the screen, there were more than 100 questions which were there. I I will say that we, we won't have time to answer each and every question. However, I would say that, you know, we would like to still take a few questions. And uh, Mehreen, do you have question and answers on your screen? Because unfortunately, I don't know when I re-logged in, some questions have disappeared. But I would like to few, uh, yes. maybe yes, the participants sir. can take some, uh, raise their hands and we can take questions. Sure. I will read out uh, the questions. And thanks, Vijayji. Now we'll take maybe the all the uh, people, all the part speakers can switch on their cameras. We will be online and we will take questions, few questions, and we will should spend I, 10 uh, minutes for question answer. Yeah. Should I uh, share my screen with the question answer chat? No, it's okay. I think uh, maybe just read a couple of questions, maybe a couple of questions for Kate. Uh, read the person's name and. Uh, all right. Yeah. And then starting with that sequence, two questions for each speaker, if okay. you can pick up. Yeah. So it's Mr. Sam Sampath Rajkumar, and the question is to Dr. Kate Metlicott. What is the mechanism to ensure countries are taking the recommendations made by WHO in their policies related to safe sanitation services? Voice is breaking. Okay. Uh, is it audible now? Yes. So the question is to Dr. Kate yeah, Metlicott. Uh, from Sampath Rajkumar, what is the mechanism to ensure countries are taking the recommendations made by WHO in their policies related to safe sanitation service chain? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So um, firstly, what you need to do is take a look at what's in the guidelines, the key recommendations there, and compare those against your national policy and plans, regulations. Um, there's actually another product which is in the pipeline from WHO called the PMAT. So it's a policy tracker. So it's a specifically a tool to help you compare what is the national um, or, or, or regional actually and the state level uh, policies, plans, strategies, regulations that um, and, and check on their alignment with the guidelines. So that would be the first thing that I would, I would recommend. Okay. Maureen, while I'm, I'm speaking, and I hope you don't mind, but there was just a couple of other things I was prompted on. I've been answering lots of questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. It seems many people were asking about survival and wastewater. I just want to really clarify that point. So just to be absolutely clear, what happens if you have COVID, even if you have a very heavy infection, Sometimes people, they swallow the that, it goes into their gut. You don't know exactly what is happening, but it seems that inside the stomach, the, the COVID is being deactivated. So you don't find live COVID in people's feces. And because of that, you don't find it in wastewater, you don't find it in sludge, 
you're not going to have an infection of COVID if you say reuse wastewater and sludge. There are you know, other person-to-person -person transmission, but we, we shouldn't, we need to be careful about not um, increasing people's fear around, around that point. Of course, there are a million other good reasons why we should be treating wastewater and sludge and safely managing sanitation systems, but we shouldn't be too afraid about additional COVID risks because of that. Is that, is that clear? Yeah, thanks, Kate, for clarification. Yeah. Marion, maybe you can take uh, more questions for Kate or something. I think yeah. Kate has answered, maybe clubbed together several responses. I was also following the question answer session. Yeah. yeah so, there are some um, questions for Kate. Just to clarify, attendees, it's, we are taking random questions, okay? So this question is from uh, Gail Masson uh, to Kate. There are questions, um, there are claims by 239 researchers that COVID-19 might pass through air and therefore by air condition, what, what the WHO's opinion? What's the WHO's opinion would have been the question? Yeah, so Yale's really up to date on this. Um, so previously, WHO was um, really focusing on the large respiratory droplets. Um, and But I think what is becoming clearer is that some of these smaller droplets may be hanging around in the air at close proximity longer than initially thought. So this is why you are seeing more emphasis on wearing of face masks and face coverings. And that is more feasible now actually because there's been a huge increase in the supply of masks. Uh, in the beginning, there was not enough masks for healthcare workers and the focus was making sure that, that the limited supply of masks was for healthcare workers. Um, but now the recommendation has expanded uh, to as masks as a precaution or face coverings um, for everyone, but it seems that um, that the real risk is, is not so much like the air conditioning or other things, but being in close proximity, especially a poorly ventilated space for you know, around 15 minutes or more. So this is what we should be really careful about for the, for the transmission risk. Um, Thanks, Kate. So should yeah, we can I just uh, maybe just add a little to on the sorry to, to um, go on longer, but it's, it's important. It's also yeah. on surfaces. It was a really important point made about um, how long it survives on surfaces and the effect that that's having on solid waste management. Again, it seems to die off relatively quickly in about an hour or, or two hours on surfaces. So we don't need to be treating all of our waste as infectious waste. That creates huge problems for waste managers. And um, uh, so I think, of course, we need to take a lot of care, but we also need to be careful that we don't create other problems and take our eye off the ball of the really important things, hand hygiene, community water and sanitation services. Um, so now we move to the next presenter. This question is for Dr. Al Moeed from Lucky Stevens. Have you succeeded in getting your co compost certified as a fertilizer? I know this can be a big hurdle in Bangladesh for use in agriculture. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Marvin. Uh, okay. So the point is uh, there are two things for agricultural purpose. One is the fertilizer, the other one is the soil conditioner, or sometimes we say organic fertilizer, which actually nourishes the soil, improves the soil quality, gives the nutrient for the plantations and vegetation. So the fertilizer has a very, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, strict standard according to the Bangladesh policy. And we have the policy for the organic compost. So when it was, uh, you know, developed during 2006, uh, at that time, the fecal sludge was not, you know, even at that time to consider it as uh, decomposed and to turn it to soil conditioner or organic fertilizer. But it didn't eliminate the ficus as well. But the point is, when we say that the compost is produced, 
I want to make it sure it's not the fertilizer, it's the soil conditioner. So uh, the standard of the soil conditioner and fertilizer is completely different and uh, definitely it uh, requires further, you know, uh, you know, policy and standard uh, development for the organic compost and uh, soil conditioner as well, I believe that. Thank you, Mohit. So, uh, Mary, and I'll take one question which I find is very interesting, and this is to Dr. Christine Mo. Uh, Vihangraj Kulkarni asks that if we use Sanipath tool, will the privacy be ensured? And if we use Sanipath tool, will the privacy be ensured? And we will would we be able to publish it as a research article? So, thank you for that very good question. And in the SaniPath deployments, we do not collect any identification material from any individual. We don't collect names. Um, we do have GIS points for where the household surveys were conducted, but that part is kept private. Um, and so I think that there's not really a problem with privacy, especially in many of the communities where we work, the population density is so great that even from a GIS point, you would not be able to identify an individual household or an individual person. So yes, you should be able to use the SaniPath tool and not worry about privacy issues and publish your results. Please don't hesitate to contact us and we can give you more information about this. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I am aware that you know we are 20 min 25 minutes above the scheduled time. I am taking the liberty as a moderator to uh, officially start thanking and closing, but make few uh, uh, statements saying that you know as CSC webinars, we all uh, will put together the questions which have come to us and refer it to all the speakers to whom the questions were uh, directed and look for responses. And we will revert back to all the uh, uh, people, uh, participants who have raised the questions, that is one. Second thing is that we would be uh, sharing all the copy of the presentations and the recording of the webinar will also be on the uh, website of CSC. Uh, we have in the past been running online training programs if there is an interest uh, as well as uh, on-site programs for how to prepare SFDs. We are also working with WHO on rollout and scaling up the water safety and sanitation planning training programs do uh, keep, keep an eye on uh, CSC India website. We are also tying up with Emory University if there is an interest on, uh, you know, SaniPath's uh, tool, how we can do training of trainers. So please keep an eye. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers, uh, uh, Emory University team, uh, WHO, Kate, uh, Chaurasya Ji from uh, CPHU, Carol and Muhit, uh, uh, joining us and Marine for putting this event together. At one point of time, I saw that when in our Zoom platform, we were having about 550 plus participants and also keep a note that this program is also live streamed. So we will also have a database. I'm assuming that we had almost 1000 people from all over the world joining and very interesting feedbacks I'm getting in the chat box. I see that you know people have enjoyed this uh, uh, day, uh, which was full of rigor, scientific information. And all, I also want to share that we are in the process of building a community of practice. CSC uh, is feeding you know, local to global. So all these international experts and the institution's knowledge, we try to contextualize to Indian context, and we want to build a network of global South practitioners working hand to hand you know, and working together shoulder to shoulder with all the global knowledge and trying to test in regional context. That's where, you know, Carol's, uh, you know, inputs uh, on the ground, what he's learning and what he was communicating are very useful. So I would like to thank with uh, all permission from all the speakers and thanks all participants who have joined. Thank you very much.